Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Anthony Tossi with Wales Darby. I'll be your presenter today. Uh, I do have a co-pilot, Jim De Palma. He's waiting in the wings. So if we do have any questions or if you need to raise your hands, Jim will be the first line of defense. I uh, do want to welcome you all to today's presentation of condensing boilers and hydronic systems. If you notice, there's a drop down in your handouts. There's a, a few takeaways for today. And uh, one of the things I found pretty interesting was the um, polypropylene venting um, document. It, it, you start to read like the first two pages and it's um, there's a lot of information just to kind of give you references to uh, the good and bad of venting on some of the products that we have available to us. So uh, this presentation shouldn't be so um, new, I hope. Uh, some of it might be, so certainly use the chat box or any questions you might have, please feel free to do so. Um, okay, let's start. It's 1031. So here, um, there's a picture of the slides uh, with the handouts that you can find and you drop down. That first one is our line sheet. That's Wales Darby's line sheet. Okay, sorry, there's a little delay. Just wanna make sure I'm doing the right thing here. So Wales Darby's third generation, two locations, Warren, New Jersey and Islandia, New York, uh, covering a really dense population part of uh, Northern New Jersey and all of Long Island and downstate Westchester and so forth. So been around 40 plus years, two locations, like I said, Long Island and New Jersey. Today's um, kind of title is capturing the condensate, and there's a, you know, a good picture of kind of like, you say, make it rain. You know, these are condensing pieces of equipment, and uh, the better we do at producing condensation, the higher our efficiencies. So this is our this is our task when we're selling high efficiency is actually installing and delivering what it's rated to do. So that's that's the challenge for today. How do we do that? All right, so capture the condensate. Savings over traditional atmospheric and non-condensing boilers can be substantial if condensing technology is designed and applied properly. I mean, that's, that's it, that's it in a nutshell. You have to be a little bit of a house whisperer. We have to go in as a designer. You have to kind of do some math and we're gonna discuss some of those things here, right? So condensing boilers with modulating burners are designed to produce condensate depending on combustion turn down and decreasing return water temperatures. That is the scary part, thinking we cannot use lower water temperature to heat someone's home, right? So today's webinar is titled Capturing the Condensate. We first need to understand how to produce condensate. So here's a good starting point. Doing a heat loss, room by room, zone by zone. Primary, secondary piping, closely spaced T's or hydro sep, polypropylene venting exhaust, fresh air intakes, setting up the boiler with combustion analyzer, and flushing and treating system piping and water. All good things. Yes, we must do all of this. If we're selling high efficiency, this is the game we live in. By doing this, we're going to separate ourselves and we'll be able to charge for for what we do and know. So why? Why heat loss provides a current heat load calc for design day conditions and better application selection. Doing the math, right? Gives opportunity to reduce water temperature and close the gap towards condensing 130 return water temp and high efficiency in the 90s, right? Confirming installed emitter BTU output and reducing water temperature is possible. We need to know what the house has when we marry a new boiler plant, right? Power plant, or we gotta make sure, hey, I need this thing to condense. We need to lower water temperature. What does the house require on a design day, worst day of the heating season? And actually, what are the emitters able to output even by lowering water temperature? All right, we do this all the time. Primary, secondary, hydraulic isolation 
allows a boiler primary and the heating system secondary to have independent delta T's. We need to understand that boiler on the wall has a fixed circulator. It has to be able to move water at a GPM, right? Gallons per minute, overcoming the head pressure of the resistance of that heat exchanger. And it's gonna be a fixed zero off on at hundred light switch approach. What we do on the other side, the secondary side, is where we have the flexibility to drive different water temperatures, different delta Ts perhaps, and even different um, BTU load requirements, okay? Primary, secondary can utilize closely spaced Ts, hydroceps, or a buffer tank and other additional benefits, right? So using a buffer tank with some volume, we could reduce some short cycling. Using a hydro separator or some kind of, you know, primary, secondary with the volume approach, we have some uh, pressure drops. We have air elimination or even debris uh, fallout, maybe some sediment coming back from the system, not going back into the boiler itself. Um, sorry, poly, uh, polypropylene venting, specially designed and tested and listed as a vent system. This is huge. It reduces liability. I mean, this is the game we're in. And I always joke around and say anything that ends in your honor really isn't a good thing. So how do we reduce liability is start using the better listed pieces of equipment. And that goes to this polypropylene uh, venting, right? So PP has a higher maximum fluid, flue gas temperature. That's where we get in trouble when we start having failures, maybe with some not listed materials. So 230 degree Fahrenheit and compared to by others listed there, 149 for PVC and 194 for CPVC. So I have a slide kind of putting a little, uh, a little dent in their uh, sale, so to speak, with um, their temperature ratings too. Combustion analyzer, it's a must. In order to do the right job, setting up the CO2 and capture the condensate, the latent heat, that's the stuff we need to get better at. If you don't understand what and how, just putting this thing on the wall, it says 96%, it doesn't mean that's what we're delivering. We need to be able to dial in the combustion side and flushing and treating, boiler warranty compliance, right? So I'm reading more and more of my own manufacturer's manuals and they're saying void of warranty, void of this and void of that. And they're basically protecting themselves because of water quality. Conditioning is what's needed. Flushing is a must from old to new, right? We need to make sure anything that's in the system is not gonna get back to that heat exchanger and start scaling up or start fouling up on the water pathways. When that happens, you know, all of a sudden everything becomes a POS and not the case. So the manufacturers protecting themselves, this needs to be paid attention to and what we need to do to set up these high efficient pieces of equipment. So, um, and there you go, you know, by now treating the water, uh, the life, you know, the system lifespan and optimizing system performance, all those things are great end results when we do the right thing in the beginning. All right, condensing uh, boiler, right? So what exactly is it? You know, I kind of put these things in my head. It's a high BTUs, low volume water, high efficiency, rated, and a modulating heat engine, right? We have pre-mixed gas burners. So these things are, are, are well designed and what they are positioning to do in the house, right? To deliver heating water, right? We wanna heat the space, we wanna keep people comfortable and also high efficiency, the energy, right? So we're in the heating and energy business. That's the game, right? So we need to get better at that energy side and that is that true setting up of the combustion. The heat exchanger, right, is made to capture the condensate, BTUs that would be lost up the flue. So typically with higher elevated um, flue product, you know, with atmospheric stuff, it kind of just leaves. And that's where we get these, you know, low to mid 80 percenters and therefore dollars spent in fuel, how much of that's going up the flue. With these, we're trying to say, hey, you put a dollar of fuel in, we're gonna hope to, you know, recoup 90, 92, 94, who knows, maybe even 96%. So it's capturing that condensate is where we got to get better at. Not just putting these things on the wall and saying, you know, look at what I did with press fittings and making it look nice and pre-building it and walking it in. We need to actually deliver high efficiency. The game right here, lowering water, uh, return water. 
All right, so lowering water re uh, return water is equals that high efficiency. All right, so roughly 130. That's the 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 the, sh the target, right? So imagine, okay, if I dial in this boiler on a design day, that's the coldest day of the season, and all I require is 140 degree water. That design day, or even let's say 140, let's say 150. Okay, let's bump that number up. So on that design day, the boiler needs to provide 150. Well, that design day is less than 2% of what we actually see in our homes, right? So that means when it's not a design day of zero, it's something warmer out. So we do not need to deliver that 150. So we can lower water temperature. These boilers have an outdoor sensor. It's it's Al Roker. It sees the weather. It sees the temperature change. It tells then how to modulate the burner based off of the load and the temperature outside. And the high limit would be our thermostats. The boiler will run its own curve based off of outdoor temperature. So with that said, if I'm not condensing on that less than 2% time of the year, I'm doing pretty good as far as the other 98%. I will be at that mark, 130 and less, lower temperature, okay? So condensing boilers are designed to take advantage of that latent heat energy, right? That latent energy. That's that's that stuff we want, the magic stuff when we dial in our CO2 with our um, combustion analyzers. We're trying, we're trying to capture that change of state and that releasing of energy from a vapor to a liquid. Because we're lowering water temperature, our flue gases are um, being able to condense. And that's that condensing, right? The capturing of condensation. We want to be able to have that wash across our heat exchanger, absorbing that heat, that latent heat. Okay, so there's that dew point in that diagram right there. And it, that green line going straight down to boiler return water temperature, that magic number for what we do for natural gas is about that 130, 133. And that's a challenge. How do we get away from this magic 180, right? I know we're sitting out here at this far end. We're installing these things on the wall. At best, if we do an outdoor sensor, I've seen many still in the box, but the idea is we're just pegging the high limit. And we are not delivering any better off than a piece of cast iron sitting on the floor. Maybe even more uh, energy is being used. I'm not, you know, calculating that in my head, but there's potential to being no better than or even using more energy. So our goal is to reduce, get that temperature down, figure out what the house loss is, doing a heat loss, marrying up the emitters to what actually needs required, room by room, zone by zone. Then we get to play nice with the boiler and lower water temperature, lowering water temperature, dialing in our CO2, capturing the dew point, high efficiency all day, every day. All right. So here it is, kind of the same picture, just kind of reiterating as we have this non-condensing versus condensing side of this, this um, diagram, the chart, all right? And we are sitting again, if you drop down in between that 120, 140, and that is what we want to drive with our high efficient condensing. Remember, the heat exchangers are made to be washed, that kind of, you know, vapor to a liquid acid of condensate. Okay. So this is a picture. I, I don't know. I, I've always used this as visual. So just take it for what it's worth. So this, um, this protractor is kind of giving me two two numbers that I always so here it is the, the lower left um, green arrow there when it's zero outside and let's say this is for typical pieces of equipment this is when I was trying to sell outdoor reset for cast iron right so you know if the system requires on the design day of zero there's the 180 I get that if that's what it's required but as it warms up do we still need to deliver 180 degree water when it's 40 degrees outside? You know, this is that approach. We need to stop getting our heads locked into high temp, high limit, high temp, high limit. We need to start being flexible with our approach. Dialing in the system, being that house whisperer, figuring out what actual load is required, room by room, zone by zone, 
taking those emitters, whether we're going to install brand new or we're going to obviously utilize what's been in the house for the last 30 years. And with that being said, as we all know, inherently, let's use baseboard for the example, it's been grossly oversized. Now's the time to take advantage of that, that surface area, right? So it's all about surface area. The, most, uh, the more surface area equals more BTUs. More BTUs is possible to lower water temperature. Again, perhaps we've got to do a loss. The lower water temperature equals more condensate, uh, condensing and higher efficiencies. So, you know, use this thing as a rule, you know, here's zero, 10 out, 20 out, 30 out going up that left side of the protractor is like, you know, yeah, we don't need 180 degree water on a 40 degree day, right? There's something much warmer outside. The house isn't losing the BTUs through transmission of, uh, you know, our value in the walls and windows and so forth. So we need to understand this, sell it, make more money doing it. All right. This is the baseline approach. Learn this. If there's anything else besides listening to me and maybe one or two things or the handouts that you have available to you, if you're not comfortable with the universal hydronics formula, I can't say I would be more than happy to get on the phone with you and make you a believer in what this thing will do for you, whether as a designer, an installer, or even as a technician. All day, every day, this is what we do. We ask those questions around this formula. And by having that information, we can answer most things in the way we need to design, flow. Um, it's delta T. The biggest thing I always say to my guys, what's your delta T? It tells you so much about your system. It tells you so much about your, your performance of your circulator, how it's reacting to the zone. The complaint is, you know, the back room is never warm. Okay, well, the back room was an addition. And they should have made its own zone, but they added it to the existing zone on the first floor. And of course, being the end of the run, the delta T might be there's not enough heat energy or BTU energy to uh, heat the space. So, you know, I'm always trying to reiterate these great little, you know, adjectives of learning what GPM and BTUH divided by delta T times 500. The lower right, and it says here, do the math. I'm trying to make this as simple as possible, right? I get it. It might be, I don't want to do it. I hate math and just give me the piece of equipment and let me install it. But if we understand what that delta T represents in a high temp system, the target, right? It's a target, not that we actually really achieve, but the target is a 20 degree split. Going out an elevated temperature, the hottest water coming off the boiler, going out through the house, returning 20 degrees cooler. Use 10,000. So if we understand that I have baseboard around the house and I know what brand it is, and I know using a water temperature of X, it's gonna give me X amount of BTUs per foot. I can simply plug in by measuring elements with a little bit respect. You know, I can get a BTU load calc as to what the emitters are possible to produce with a certain water temperature. I could divide that by 10,000, which is that 20 degree uh, delta T going out and coming back. And now I can get a GPM. So now I'm really kind of dialing in other parts and pieces of a system, like our circulators, or maybe even pipe sizing, okay? So it really kind of goes in multiple areas where we can hunt and peck for solutions, you know, and fixing problems. We get paid a lot of money if we can understand how to fix problems. This is one of those things. This is a money maker right here, all right? If I'm using something less than a, high temp approach, baseboard, hydrocoils, indirects, uh, the 10 degree split for, for a panel rads, or not panel rads, but maybe some low temperature baseboard, radiant. We don't no, no longer need the 10,000, that BTU divided by 5,000, right? So where does this all come from, right? That 500, delta T times 500, 20 times 500, 10,000. Delta T of 10 times 500, 5,000, okay? That 500 represents what you see at the bottom, a gallon of water, 60 minutes in an hour, 
and the specific gravity of water, pure water, is one. It always starts at one. So 8.33 times 60 times one, 499.6.8, round it up, keep the number simple. So that 500 is a constant. If it's glycol, that number will change. Okay, so just understanding other mediums, it's not water, it's something different, then that 500 will change, it has to. So we have to be aware of what the percentage of glycol is being used in our systems so we can appropriately size for our circulators. Okay. And just, just to reiterate, I, I'm not gonna go too deep into like all the parts and pieces of a house. Trust me, this is gonna take a turn and I hope you're ready. So yes, you can lower water temperature and still heat the space with baseboard. This baseboard has always been married to this 180 or higher. You need to look at the performance charts here. So this is a certain brand Sterling product, heat trim, and they're showing you there's the 180 in the, in the chart all the way to the right. And we're listing a three quarter fin, or, uh, sorry, three quarter copper or half inch copper. And at that four GPM, um, you'll see it, it produces every foot of element now with 180 degree of water, about 590 BTUs. The goal is, all right, Ant, we have all this baseboard. I agree it's way oversized. How low can we go, right? So you see the chart from right to left, 180, 170, 150, 140. We wanna live in that 140 right to 130 and that's when we know we'll start condensing on the boiler side right capture the condensate that's the goal high efficiency so down at the bottom where i'm sorry up to the left here bedroom heat loss if we did that on a zero degree day worst day of the year coldest day of the year that room requires 4,000 btus we measured the, the bedroom has 15 feet of the three quarter inch rb750 and down the bottom, 15 feet at the 530 of 170, not 180. 180 is leaving the boiler. So we have to assume that water is going to cool down. So average water temperature flowing from boiler supply out to boiler return. You know, we're shooting for a 20, but we're going to use somewhat middle of the road to size the baseboard so we don't undersize. So I went with the 170 and that's 530 BTUs now. So down the bottom, 15 times 530, that's close to 8,000 BTUs. That's every day of the heating season. Thermostat calls, pulls into relay, boiler fires, high limit, 180, regardless of the outdoor temperature. That's old school. That's old school plus we're trying to do outdoor reset. How well do we do that? You know, think about that. It's a fear factor about adding stuff and not the, you know, the true uh, knowing of it. So now if I took a lower water temperature, I'm gonna install a new boiler. Let's call it this wall mount high efficient condensing product. Advertised at 90 some odd percent efficient. Goal is you got a lower water temperature. You cannot, you cannot deliver 180 to the system anymore. If you want to achieve the other side of the, you know, the equation, high efficiency, right? We're taking 30 year old home up and running, been doing great. Boiler was due a few years back. They finally came in. We're gonna do the high efficiency stuff. We need to marry now that a product with the emitters with a heat loss calc. We see what the true numbers on a design day, that's our CYA, right? That's where we're gonna know, hey, there's 30% fudge in the numbers doing a heat loss calc. There's more than enough room. So let's look at the chart now. I wanna condense. I wanna condense 98% of the heating season. When it's something around that zero, 10, five, zero, I'll make the boiler produce 150, maybe 160 if it has to, but it's such a small percentage of the heating season that I know for the other 98%, I'm gonna be well below that 130 and less condensing, condensing, high efficient, high efficient, capturing condensate. So look at the chart, 130 now, same four GPM, 
is 270. So I went from 530 to 270. Don't get all nervous. We're still pushing heat out. Do the math, 15 times 270, 4,050 BTUs. Now we splitting hairs here, we're getting nervous. I just don't feel comfortable. You know, are you gonna start adding baseboard to achieve the 130? Are you gonna play nice with the boiler and maybe bump it up to 135-ish, you know? But remember that 4,000, if we did a heat loss calc, there's typically a 30% fudge factor in there. So that 4,000 has 30% fudge. I think we'd be pretty good with that 130 even producing that 40, uh, 4,050 BTUs for that particular application. Now, that would be a room by room. So let's be honest, we have then have to take the other bedrooms, the living room going around the house and try to you know, marry up, right? It's a shell game. Well, we're good here, we're, we're way over here, we can lower water, but over here, we're kind of splitting hairs. So you kind of have to take each situation as, as it comes based off of, what's been installed or what you planning on, what planning on installing. All right, so what is the value of condensate and BTUs? Why are we chasing the tail of condensate? This BTU shell game, right? High efficiency is what we wanna be in. Seems like we can make a lot of money selling this stuff, hanging these small, easy to carry, you know, I could do it myself getting older now, whatever. I can, you know, not lump and hump cast iron, I can pre-build these things. I can walk it into the basement, hang it, you know, work like a gentleman, so to speak. So look at it this way. When vapor turns into a liquid, we're capturing that condensate from the flue products trying to leave the building. So when we change from a vapor to a liquid, there is energy that's released, roughly 970 BTUs per pound of condensate that we could um, claim, that we could actually uh, you know, put in a bucket and say that's five gallons and now we can put a number to how many BTUs that we reclaimed from flu product that would normally leave the building. So if one pound of 212 water is changing state from vapor to a liquid, it contains 970 BTUs of latent heat. That's the stuff we don't you know, really see, right? The sensible is what we see and feel. The latent is that invisible stuff. So one gallon of condensate equals just over 8,000 BTUs, right? So there's a gallon of water, 8.33 times 970 equals 880 in BTUs. Our goal is to make it rain. Make that, make the boiler condensate, right? That's the goal, that, that's the end all. That's when we know, looking at a neutralizer, you ever go to a house and a neutralizer's bone dry like day one? It's like, what's going on here? You know, this boiler's never condensed. This boiler's not even achieving any high efficiency. Again, put cast iron. If that's your game, if that's your speed, if you wanna go further, this is the kind of stuff we're trying to promote. Wales Darby has been an educating rep forever. And I can say with the team that we have, we're second to none trying to work and help drag you along if we must and showing you the way with doing the math better product you know being smarter in your approach how to make more money all right decreasing water uh i'm sorry decreasing returning water temperature that's also you got to break that fear we got to understand if i have emitters that can use low water temperature and still produce enough btus to satisfy the space we have to be confident in doing the math, doing that, doing that heat loss. It's uh, so important. Anthony, right. if I could interject a second. One no. comment that came in from uh, one of the attendees was, is that the problem is that the homeowners don't know this and are used to being blasted with high heat all winter long. And, okay, so and, go ahead, Jimmy, go ahead. You wanna answer that? Sorry. So, so my response was, well, yes, depends on the boiler control that comes on that boiler that can uh, compensate for that. But also it's everybody's job to educate that homeowner as to what's gonna be happening within the system. Yeah, um, I'm gonna add, so I, I kind of said something, we are in the comfort and energy business. And maybe it's that idea, you ever ask somebody if they're comfortable 
how many different answers someone might say. And we have to be able to clear the minutia, so to speak. You know, I joke around. I, I do a Fujitsu training class and things like of other nature. And I, and I talk about controls. And in that world, they don't have thermostats. They have a remote control. And there's a number. And I, and I always illustrate like I'm talking about my grandmother, right? Think about that, that technology and, and that, uh, that scope there. You know, technology is not someone in their 80s or 90s, right? So they want a T87F on a wall. The idea is if you were to cover the number on a thermostat right now and ask somebody if they were comfortable, what would they say? I know my grandmother, and I've done this. She'd go, move your hand. I can't see the number. And I'm like, wait a second, Graham, you can't tell me if you're comfortable. It's like, I told you, I can't see the number. Move your hand. And until I move my hand, she goes, yep, there's my number. I'm comfortable. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a total feel, sensory, noise, light, heat, body temperature. All those things is comfort. And that's where we have to, you know, drive what we do really well keeping people comfortable is the game that's the other side of it we need to get better at the energy right we need to prove what we're doing and now we can charge more we can go in and fix people's problems you know there's there's a there's a ball that's rolling if you get in it or on it man we can take this far we can do better at doing you know high limit no outdoor reset and because it's a box on a wall, yeah, I'm a high efficiency installing contractor. Listen, I, I think I have better things to do that day. You know, I always joke around. I go to a job and I'm like, okay, where's the water? Or, you know, there's no water on the floor and you think you did your job. There's no leaks, you know? So not to beat this up, I'm just trying to say, we need to move the ball forward. We need to get a little better at setting up high efficiency equipment so that they actually do what they were designed to do. Condensing, condense, all right? So the picture up here is talking about when we do capture condensate, we need to treat it. We need to um, bring it back to a neutral pH. Um, right now, if we're doing our job and all that we see inside of these uh, boilers on the wall, when that vapor turns back into a liquid and we capture that BTUs that normally leave in the building, it's at about that three, to 4.5. So, you know, I used to say it's like lemon, or they're saying here it's a citrus or some kind of uh, juice or uh, soda, all right? Or even black coffee. I was reading that last night late. I'm like, wow, think about all the black coffee we drank. And now we want to neutralize, we want to bring it back to 7 pH, which is a neutral, right? So, so now we can properly put it down the drain. If you were to, and I've had this in the city, done a jobs in New York City where it was a five-story walk up and, you know, loft approach floor, or first through fifth floor, each individual apartments. And, you know, we had uh, products on the wall there and they were dumping into a copper drain line and there was no neutralizers. It was the one thing that they, they took out of the job because that costs money. And I was with the landlord and I said, well, this is my approach. Where's your neutralizers? And he looked at me like I had three heads. I, like, I have no idea what that is. I said, yeah, you're dumping your condensate into that copper drain. And from the fifth to the fourth, fourth to the third, and all the way down, you're gonna have some problems if you don't neutralize your condensate back to neutral. So I don't know what he ever did with that, but the idea is I made him aware, we need to neutralize our condensate. All right, so this is it. Thermal efficiency versus combustion efficiency. What is the difference? That yellow sticker. We are thinking because it comes out of the box with that yellow sticker stating how efficient it is. If we all have to do is put it on the wall and learn about piping it and maybe get involved with some funky looking venting pipe now, that that box is going to produce high, high efficiency. I call bullshit. That is not going to happen at all. All right. We need to be aware of what our true responsibility is. That thing in the lower left corner, if you have one, Get it calibrated. If you have one and you don't know how to use it, learn. We need to understand going into our jobs. This is dotting our I's and crossing our T's. We need to be able to dial in the CO2. All right. This is going to give us our latent heat. All right. So the 90% 90, 90 of what we call sensible versus the 10 plus 2 
or point to there of latent. The latent is what's going to give us that high efficiency condensation. All right. All right. Jim, we have a poll question here. Okay. Just answering some questions. Let's get to the poll questions. Let's select one. Here we go. We're launching. All right, gents. When will a condensing boiler condense? Please select one. Should have launched, correct? Oh, it launched. Okay. It says collecting responses. 77% voted. Do you see okay. that? No, I'm not seeing that on my side. You don't see the polls? Oh, here we are. Sorry about that. Okay. Just answering questions. Good questions, by the way. Awesome. 80%, correct? It's coming up? 80%. Yep. Just about a minute, so. All right, you're at 94%. No, no, you're at 80%. What's the, 80%. now? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There you go. Gonna close it? Yeah, let's close it. All right. <laughs> and we'll share it. And we're gonna share it. So, and the results yes, are 100% nailed it. Excellent job, everybody. Excellent job. All right. So, when the return water temperature is at 130 or less, that's that's key. All right. And I'll hide that. All right. Next slide. Let's move along here. All right. So just looking back at the sensible versus latent. So 100% energy content of natural gas. Uh, propane or even uh, fuel oil has its own separate kind of, um, um, well, it's, it's kind of on the um, dew point. So maybe I'm talking out of turn here. So the orange, the larger piece at 90%, right? Heat that can be measured or felt by change in temperature. All right. So that's kind of the idea of maybe in comfort. So the blue, the latent, the 10%, that's the stuff we really want to capture. Heat when added or removed resulting in a change of, um, I think it's says change of water to steam or, or uh, liquid to a vapor, okay? Natural gas is divided into two types of heat, sensible representing a change of temperature and latent representing a change of state, all right? So 212 water to 212 steam with no change in temperature. It's just changing state. All right, so condensate equals savings by removing that latent heat from the flue gas and delivered back to that boiler water. That vapor to liquid raining inside polypropylene, crossing our heat exchanger, uh, reabsorbing that BTUs that would normally leave the space, the building. That's what we're trying to achieve here, all right? All right, so here it is, a water vapor, changing to a liquid, energy released, there's the latent heat. That's what the game, that's what we're trying to do. So water vapor turns a liquid, it reduces in temperature, and that's that flu product trying to leave. It's so already reduced in temperature, it condenses, it, 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 it collapses on itself and thereby releases that heat energy and BTUs that we wanna wash across our heat exchangers. That's where we're gaining our efficiencies, all right? So what influences the rate of condensation, right? Flu gas dew point. That's what we do with our dialing in with our combustion analyzers, okay? In every installation instruction manual, depend, not, not, I don't care what manufacturer you're installing or aligned with, in there it will state, you need to go ahead and dial in, confirming with your analyzer a CO2 of this, okay? That then is gearing us up for that high efficiency approach to what that appliance was actually designed to do, all right? CO2 is the game. So dew point charts for natural gas. 
It's all about CO2. When it comes down to the opportunity for the flue gas to condense, lower right is just kind of giving you, this is a manufacturer's stamp. This is what they're stating. This is a piece of client, this boiler, this model, whatever there is, they're giving you the guidelines in which we need to set it up. Um, right? So there's your, um, your, your combustion analyzer. Make sure it's calibrated, gentlemen. You got to make sure this is really dialed in so we get true, accurate reading. This is your liability too. Printing out, having a document stating, I dialed in this piece of equipment. These are the readings I had when I left after commissioning. Again, liability, right? So I always choke and say, anything that ends in your honor. These, this might be just that thing to keep you moving down the road and making money and not losing money. The chart is illustrating this CO2, 10 to eight. Now, again, depending on the manufacturers, this is an example. So the green, higher the CO2 equals higher dew point, more condensate. Again, capturing the condensate, that BTU returning to the heat exchanger only increases our efficiency. If we were to have something less than, you know, a lower CO2, again, lower dew point, lower condensate, less efficiency. So you see on the chart there, the dew point, uh, depending on where you're at. I mean, yes, we can deliver lower water temperatures and still condense, but we lost the opportunity to do it at a higher temperature, that 130. We had to wait till it dropped down even lower to condense. So dialing in that dew point, right, the CO2, that's really where we want to be, that sweet spot, right? So again, manufacturers listings, they're showing you the, the, the path, the road in which to take. We take a piece of equipment called a combustion analyzer. We put it into the flue pipe leaving the exhaust and we get accurate reading as to what actually is doing on the combustion side of that piece of equipment. We now have the ability with adjustment screws to dial in watching our combustion analyzer change its reading to a positive or a negative approach. Obviously, you always want to go to wherever the system needs to be set up, locking it down. This now will prove that we are delivering that high efficient state of uh, heating. All right. So less condensate needs lower efficiency, right? So we have this or maybe we don't have this, you know, how many times, you know, it is, I, I did it already. I, I did it myself. I just know, or, you know, years ago, I, I can see it. I just know when it's right. Yeah, that's out. And again, I call bullshit on that too. So, you know, you need to have a piece of equipment that actually can see that latent heat, that dew point, the condensate, the, condens uh, the, the, the condensing, sorry, the condensing of what we should achieve, right? It's all about CO2 when it comes up to the opportunity for flue gases to condense. It's all about the CO2, all right? So yeah, there's this stoichiometric combustion, right? So years ago, we used to have a manufacturer and I had something called Lambda Pro in their, in their program. And the Lambda Pro was supposedly, um, you know, taking the air side and the fuel side and perfectly matching it up, even with the fluctuations, right? So there is the true dialing in so we can have 100% combustion. So for natural gas, it says right there, 11.9 CO2. Yeah, but that's so dialed in when there's some fluctuation in pressure or temperature or humidity, you know, we could be, you know, fouling up the burner. We can be doing uh, more harm than good. So we do like to position ourselves with a little bit of, you know, fudge factor. So, you know, 10 parts of air to one part natural gas, 25 parts uh, air to one part propane, you know, 1344 cube of air to one gallon number two. Yeah, those all have their own parameters in which we can dial it in. But we also have to be realistic in our approach and we need some safety, right? So here's the world, real world combustion, you know, very difficult to maintain that perfect air to fuel ratio, right? Due to temperature change, pressure, you know, the furnace pressure itself, perhaps a draft pressure or fan con, you know, these are things that we can't always control. So we have that one part fuel and 10 parts air, but yet there's this other lying factors. So excess air is added to counteract these effects. 
provides a safe operation. So typically we're shooting like, you know, the magic numbers, about 10% excess air, all right? The deal is this, again, by setting up our combustion analyzer, we know exactly how much excess air. So more excess air equals lower CO2, which means lower dew point, which means less condensate, again, less efficiency. So, you know, just know where our thresholds are and um, we should be good on both sides of our liability approach and also our promises, what we're delivering as far as efficiencies. All right. All right, Jim, if you're up, poll number two, sir. All right. Answering a lot of good questions here. Fantastic. You want me All to right. do the poll? Uh, please. All right, fair enough. I'll take it over. I got it. I'm sorry. Here we go. All right, everybody. What influences the rate of condensation? Please select. Sixty-five. Thirty seconds yeah. in, sixty-six percent of you voted. Yeah, this is good. They're jumping in. Seventy-one. All right. Give it a couple more seconds. All right, you want to close that one? Yeah, we're at 84% after a minute. I think we're good. So let's share. Everybody should see that. Yeah, 79%, right? Yes, sir. All the above. So yeah, there's no wrong answers here. There's just multiple correct answers. So all the above is definitely, um, you know, how much moisture, again, the dew point, higher the CO2. Again, it kind of gives you the answer. Higher dew point, more condensation, and reducing water temperature, you know? It's that, you know, shell game. It's, it's making sure we're, we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's across both the system side, what it's requiring water temperature-wise, understanding lower the water returning to the boiler, the best chances for it to condense, and then obviously setting it up with our combustion analyzers. All right, let's going to hide that one. And hey, just we'll, to let you know, Anthony, a couple of questions that have come up is, yeah. um, one was, do I have to do this on all condensing boilers? And another question was, how do I do this on the condensing boilers? Well, answer is yes and yes. How do you do it? Where do you want to start? Do you need to learn how to do a heat loss calc? Do we need to understand what the emitters in the building can actually produce with lowering water temperature, right? Then that actually gives us the ability to go after the appliance. So that to me is where I'm always gonna start. I'm always gonna start with what is required on the worst day of the year. If I get that number, that's my foothold. That's where I work around. I know I'm gonna cover my CYA here on the coldest day of the year, the phone is not going to ring about someone having a lack of heat. That's where it all goes outward. From there, outward. I marry the emitters, take baseboard, lowering water temperature. There's a threshold there. I don't feel so comfortable. Fine. But remember, anything we talk about is actually for less than 2% of our heating season. It's so small of a number that we are in design day conditions. Therefore, if the moving target of watching the outdoor temperature fluctuate, there the water can also fluctuate. So if that design day I can get as close and reducing water temperature as close to condensing, chances are 98% of the season, the rest of the heating season, I will be below return water temperature of 130. I will then produce and promote good, you know, fuel. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? 
a moisture or dew point of our, our, our flu gases leaving, raining it, make it rain, right? Capturing that condensate, crossing that heat exchanger, reclaiming that BTUs that normally is leaving. High efficiency equals less energy dollars. Bottom line, bottom line. All right, hopefully I answered that. If not, hook me up, dial, dial me direct. We'll have a long conversation. All right, next slide, piping, right? So remember we had heat loss. We had, uh, you know, doing heat loss. We had primary, secondary. We had, uh, what else was in there? I can't remember the list of things we needed to do. So understanding piping, right? Understanding the primary, secondary. There's multiple ways we can approach this. You just gotta understand it has to be done. There's very little chances, very small opportunities where we wouldn't need to do primary, secondary. I'll give you an ex a scenario. Here on Long Island, we have these, what they call hubs. They're building out of the ground these multi-apartment approach, you know, uh, millennials not wanting to own anything, the rentals close to the railroad station, downtown, little, uh, you know, uh, areas for them to roam and eat and drink and go home and do whatever. In those scenarios, if I had a condensing boiler, say a combi doing domestic and space heating, that space might require so little of emitters or BTU output that the pump has the ability to overcome not only the friction loss of the heat exchanger in the actual boiler, but maybe even the coil, let's say it was a hydro coil, or maybe the you know, eight to 10 feet of baseboard that was in the space. So that's a very small, almost, you know, invisible application. But in real world, what we do in typical residence, something much larger than, you know, let's say a 600 square foot apartment or something like that, you know, we typically are gonna have to do primary, secondary, all right? Using closely spaced tees, we can use a hydro separator, low loss header. We can even use a buffer tank. Okay, these are approaches in the piping. It's it's nothing new. It's been around for many many years. It just needs to get uh, perfected a little better. Understanding spacing, understand pipe sizing for delivering a certain flow to then achieve the BTU output required. You know that flow across that heat exchanger. It has to be at a certain flow or GPM, not to uh, overshoot or, you know, uh, high limit for a safety, you know, so we need to move water. That would be our fixed uh, speed circulator there. So hydraulic separation allows a boiler and a system components to get the flow they need when they need it without compromising the other's performance. It's primary side, secondary side. And I've heard people mix it and say, well, well, you know, the primary is the heating and then the secondary is the boiler. So whatever your approach is, just know what you need to do to set up the boiler side, okay? Boiler side, heating side. The boiler needs its own requirement. The heating side needs its own requirement. Closely spaced T's is what decouples one side hydraulically, hydronically also to the other. So, all right. So primary or piped with low loss headers. Again, dedicated circulator for heat exchanger. We gotta move that water at a certain fixed speed, not to hit high limit and go off on a safety. Fixed speed circulators is a must, again, kind of redundant here. And system piping can still be moose antlers or looped with closely spaced tees. And that's what the two illustrations are showing you there. So whatever your comfort level is, we can probably make it work just understanding what and how, whether you're buying something already out of the box, easy to install, it's already engineered, hooking up supply from the boiler, return to the boiler, supply to the system, return from the system. You know, there's some added features when we can do that stuff. So uh, primary, secondary piping here. And um, you can see that closely spaced T's max of four pipe diameters, no more than 12 inches. That's That's key. We want to create such a, low pressure drop or zero pressure drop that we don't have um, flow not getting to where we have to go. The other picture is showing a low loss header and these are some regurgitated slides from my past life. But primary secondary is not new. 1954, Bell and Gossett, right? Increased system temperature drop, looking to achieve, you know, increase of system controllability. 
you know, utilizing low to medium temperature were allowed due to primary secondary pumping. Sounds like high efficiency in its infancy. So, you know, this illustration here showing those closely spaced T's, if that was our boiler above it, we can have flow going in a lot of different directions, not just what goes in nicely and what comes out nicely. It's a mixed bag of flow depending on what you got going on in the system. You have multiple zones in the house. Is it one zone calling versus the boiler circulation? You know, this next, uh, this next slide hopefully is a little bit amped up in respect of a commercial approach, but it really illustrates. I don't care if you're closely spaced T's, one inch, inch and a quarter, low loss header, using some kind of commercial approach, the dynamics are still there. So in these illustrations, it says balance flow. And the left side of these pictures is the boiler and the right side of these illustrations is the system. If the system and the boiler were equal and what everything was being asked, everything was calling, the boiler was full out, right? The matching load of the space to the BTU output of the boiler, you would see very little mixing. Nothing going on in between the upper uh, flanges and the lower flanges, if you're Italian, the flanges, right? So it would be direct supply out to the system, direct return reboot get those btus back up temperature wise back out to the system well the second one the illustration in the middle it says primary is greater than the secondary flow well maybe only half the zones are calling now in the building we're going to have this direct return from the supply side of the boiler direct return back to the return side of the boiler mixing again with the return water coming back from the system so that approach that analogy what goes into a T must come out of a T. That's how we give off BTUs or heat energy when we're doing primary, secondary, perhaps with multi temps, um, you know, application, whether we have radiant or baseboard or whatever, even with a cast iron piece of boiler. Uh, I'm sorry, even with a cast iron boiler, we can ap approach the primary, secondary and understand what our lowest water temperature going back to that non condensing piece of equipment may be protecting that non-condensing boiler from short life or killing itself because we made it rain in that flue product. We made the condensation happen because we lowered water temperature so low that you know um, we actually can um, rot out our flue pipes and, and now even, even sections on cast iron perhaps over some longevity of time. But the right illustration showing you primary is less than the secondary. So sometimes we can even have a higher flow requirement and have a lower flow on the on the boiler side. So this is all what's happening in that kind of pressure drop. That that large area, that open area, there's a pressure drop there, and flow will seek its own. What goes into a T must come out of a T. That's just the dynamics of flow. All right, venting. Really key. Um, I can't say enough. This is one of the the Achilles heels out there that I'm I'm finding. You know, it's an art. It's an art on top of everything else we need to do. If there's one, one little feather in your cap and you say you understand venting, man, I wanna have a conversation with you. Because there is a true approach to making sure we as an industry get this straight. This is causing so much havoc on our equipment with short lifing electrodes and igniters and cross contamination, exhausting this byproduct, the flu, and re-energizing it or reclaiming it right back to our fresh air. So there is this need to get better at venting, okay? Not only in how we lay out our systems, but now the liability side. We need to um, get better at selecting the proper materials. Polypropylene, in my opinion, is the only way to go. We play in that lower right quadrant the um, category five, uh, four rather, condensing air, uh, corrosion res you know, resistant. That's where we want our materials to play nice. Lowering that water temperature, less than 140, okay? Condensation, right? Condensing. So that's that acid approach. That's that neutralizing back to seven, remember? So we have this medium now that we want to have, we want to play nice with, we want to achieve, we need to know we're selecting the right material that can handle that. 
So this was something I kind of dug out. Actually, I raped and pillaged another a PowerPoint, but it's showing you polypropylene PVC and CPVC. The biggest thing in the liability and what I choose to kind of ask you guys to open your minds up a little bit and taking this, this, taking this to heart because it's liability. It's a design system, it's engineered, it's listed as a system. Polypropylene has a max flu temperature of 230 degrees Fahrenheit. And look at PVC sitting down there at 149. And that's an elevated number right there. And I have something to show you, which I was very surprised to find out. And then the CPVC is kind of above PVC, but you know, this is, this is the, the reality check. Do you think the flu gases in a condensing boiler that was never dialed in with a, uh, a, um, a combustion analyzer or is being utilized of an outdoor reset, do you think that flu gases temperature is less than or greater than what PVC is rated for? Because that's where I see a lot of my systems. You know, byproducts, uh, other, you know, uh, by, um, products by, by others, me being on a job site and I see outdoor resets in the box. Sometimes I don't even see the condensate trap being hooked up. Now I'm wondering what they're spilling in the space there. But the idea is chances are they pegged at high limit. They think 180, this thing is never going to condense. But what is going to happen now to that flu gases leaving the building with an inferior piece of uh, product material? It's going to exceed its limit or its temperature limitations. There is the liability. There is the crossroads right there. What game or what side of that liability line do you want to be on? Know and protect yourselves, right? So. Polypro, 230, it's even actually higher. That's what we have to be rated to. And we are, and, and some, right? Softening temperature, I thought this was kind of interesting. So 302 versus 176. Well, there's that scenario. What do you think again? High limit approach, 180 temperature, no outdoor reset, all day long, every day, that flu product is an elevated flu gas. At what temperatures though? Exceeding? Again, maybe having some detrimental results. Unfortunately, people can be, you know, not living anymore kind of approach. So I don't want to scare everybody, but the thought is it could happen, right? So melting temperature, safe and healthy product. Yeah, those guys, a lot of V's in there, right? A lot of C's in there, chlorides, chlorine, not good. This is the stuff that's actually backwashing if it's leaching out of our out of those guys' pipes across our heat exchangers. You got to understand that. You got to step up to the plate and use a listed system. Polypropylene. There's a couple different brands out there. All right. Dangerous substance. We're not. They are. Again, we choose to go cheap. Well, the manufacturer says it's okay. Yeah, they got big lawyers too. So protect yourself. Anything that ends in your honor really isn't a good thing. Fully recyclable. I thought that was interesting. I was like, wow, I didn't, had no idea. Plastic has, or I'm sorry, polypropylene has that label of recyclables, right? And the weight, you know, I thought that was kind of interesting too, just kind of pulling out the obvious. So here it is. This is right out of Z Flex. This is our Z Den, the polypropylene single wall. Polypropylene has a higher max flu gas temperature of 230 and compared to PVC 149, CPVC 194, polypropylene easily 100% recyclable where C, uh, PVC and CPVC is not due to chemical composition, right? There's the, the number five in those rotating arrows, right? PP, recyclable. I thought that was kind of good to draw to the attention of everybody. PV has a higher temperature limit and range working and softening makes it safer for vent material. Liability. You got to understand the value of this, right? PP will not leach out any chlorides, which can attack metal heat exchangers. The most expensive part of a heating system is the boiler, and we're not even paying attention to how we're killing it. Jesus. Go sneeze on it. All right. So design and tested safe, unlike PVC and CPUC. I'm gonna I'm gonna kill this a little bit because uh, this is a little bit close to the 
to my uh, my heart right now. And I'm like, this is my mission. ZDENS is specially designed and tested and listed as a vent system. They're not. Again, manufactured for uh, from environmentally safe, fire retardant, you know, polypropylene offers superior performance, uh, does not require explosive and toxic cleaners or primers and cement. You know, this is reality. We're using a product that needs to be fused with a chemical. It has an outgas, it's flammable. How long are you waiting? Are you turning, you know, the blower on if you can? You know, know how to trick out the blower motor just to turn and exhaust that the uh, uh, fumes from before you fire off. You know, are we creating a little bit of a, you know, a flamethrower here or an explosion? So, you know, know what the the end results are if we're not allowing for uh, drying or time for, um, you know, venting of those uh, necessary things, right? So self sealing, it has like a 20 inch uh, water column of uh, positive and negative as far as our sealing systems that we can offer, right? And can be used for venting appliance in New York City. PVC and CPVC, not so much. If you don't know this and you ever try to install and you've been inspected and you got knocked down, there's a letter, it's in your handouts. That's one of the things I asked to have in, you know, as a handout today and it's saying PVC not permitted in New York City. They don't want it. Okay, it's not listed as a system, so don't install it or think you can get around it. All right, here it is tested and listed at ULC S636. All right, now that's a Canada um, um, standard. Uh, years ago, S636 was when we were doing a lot of the stainless steel gasketed. You know, again, the flu products of condensing is an acid. We needed a material that was going to be enough. AL29-4C, I believe it was. I haven't seen that in many years. And now it's polypropylene's taken over. So, you know, conforms with the UL1738. And I, and I found this to be kind of interesting. And some of the things they list here in the 1738. Class one, venting system suited for gas-fired appliance, producing flue gas temperatures above 275 Fahrenheit, but not more than 473. Okay. Even the article does not cover metal venting. Note this category does cover stainless steel. Uh, this vent type is also class two approved to cover temperatures below 135. So there we are. So this is also talking about when we're in that 135 or less condensing. Okay, so we're talking about a standard here. Look at this next slide. So class 2A, specifically for temperatures up to including 149. A magic number for PVC. Maybe this is why it's listed in some of our manufacturers, not some, probably most, if not all. So the PVC polyvinyl chloride uh, used as a flue gas venting is specially covered in this, uh, specifically covered in this classification. For PVC, the suitable temperature limit is 140 though, right? However, the UL 1738 standard allows manufacturers to exceed this temperature by 10 percent, uh, 10 degrees for the flue gas and not liquid such as used in the test. So it's interesting. They're giving a bump. They're giving a bump and that's how they get to the 149. So PVC, if I went to Charlotte Pipe, I have a letter and it states, we do not recommend. We suggest not to be used. I mean, the manufacturer of the pipe itself is telling you not to do it. But because the piece of equipment, the water heater, whatever manufacturer you're aligned with says it's okay, we never question why. Why do we, well, I don't want to pay for that other stuff that's more expensive. There's a reason. It's listed. It's a system approach. It takes away liability. Okay? I think I killed this enough. Like I said, a lot of passion here. All right, the other side, water treatment. Man, doing a lot of searching. A lot of installation instruction manuals. Hope you guys read those. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Again, talk about liability. Yeah. Right here, water treatment. Owner's responsibility, number seven. Keep the boiler free of damaged scale deposits. Okay. I have a bad heat exchanger. It's it's deemed to be bad. Manufacturer wants it back. They cut it open to go, <laughs> never gonna happen. Prove to me that you treated the water. There's products, there's industry inside industries now, right? Think about that, you know? 
we need people to service and maintain these heat exchangers, right? If you're in the world of uh, on-demand water heaters, there's what has been in the past this requirement, you know, no longer sitting on the floor for 12 years and kettling all day. These on-demand water heaters, these heat engines produce a lot of really hot water in a very short period of time. They start to kind of foul up the heat exchangers. They need to be serviced, right? They need to be flushed and descaled. Kind of that same approach in what we're talking about here. The materials, the stainless steel, the grade of stainless steel, the water pathways, you know, velocity, having the circulator married to that heat exchanger to move water so that we prevent things from starting to, you know, um, shorten or reduce our path or flow paths, right? And that's that, that high limit stuff. When we don't have heat energy or heat transfer, for sure, we're gonna have a faulty, fatiguing heat exchanger. So chemicals, pre-treatment, before you even commission a new system, right? Here we go. These are some of the things. Let me go back here. I apologize. I'm gonna read the rest of that. So here was number 21. This is the warranty exclusions. So this is for us guys, you know, the guys on the industry side. So number 21 was any damage or failure of the boiler due to accumulation of solid materials or lime deposits. They're protecting themselves. And this is not just ours, as far as my manufacturer, this is all manufacturers. It's gotta be, it's gotta be. So primary, secondary has to be, right? Treating and, and um, you know, preconditioning has to be understanding how we need to maintain our heat exchangers, right? Number 22, any damages or failure resulting from improper water chemistry. Say what, say what? See installation manual full warranty chemistry requirements. So where do we live? Do we have well water? Do we have water softeners? You know, what are we doing to protect the heat exchangers? Are we, are we trucking in special water to fill our systems with? Are we taking tap water? What is the hardness? What are the things that where, I mean, are we pool guys? I mean, I mean like, are we doing, uh, you know, chemistry uh, litmus test in a pool? Where's our pH? Beware the lack of maintenance will void warranty. Bottom line. All right. Uh, this warranty is void. Boil the water with contaminants, sludge, silt, sand, flux residue, water hardness, levels outside the limits, water with pH, chlorides greater than. Copper, I mean, like it doesn't stop. Protect yourselves, understand what the line in the sand has been drawn for you guys to be that heating comfort specialist. This is part of the game now, it's a must do, all right? The industry inside the industry. So I always ask, raise a hands if you guys can see my hand, who in here services what you install, you know? And I always get not too many guys in my classes raising their hands. They don't want to service what they want they install, right? I'm saying, why not? It's a revenue stream. You got to understand where low hanging fruit to make money, right? You're back in these people's homes. Maybe they have a water heater. Maybe they have uh, mini splits on the wall, or they have don't have mini splits on the wall. You know, there are different approaches to what your eyes can see, so your mouth can offer more opportunities when you're in these people's homes. Poll number three. I'll do it. Poll <laughs> number th I got it. All right, it's launched. Is that the wrong one? Oh, here we go. My apologies. My bad. All right, poll number three. Polypropylene venting has a max continuous flue gas temperature rating of 230 degree Fahrenheit, 54% higher than PVC. True or false? This is a layup, gentlemen. This is a gift. Not that you're getting any door prizes today. Hopefully, my education is enough. <laughs> Give a prize. Give a prize. <laughs> Give a prize. Yeah. Here's your tip. Wear your seatbelt. <laughs> Oh, don't give up your day job. Comedy is not your forte. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but being honest is. All right, 74% voted. Looks like we're doing pretty well here. 
Uh, I mean, looking at the results, I think we're good to close this one. This is a, this is a layup, gentlemen. I'm going to close it, and then we'll share the results, obviously. And it is – come on. Come on, baby. Share. Okay, true. So thanks to all that played nice and listened. And, yes, the protection in the proper listed system – for elevated flu products is PolyPro 230. And this is weird. It says share again and hide. Okay. All right. I think we're actually coming down to the wire. Look at this. Not bad. Come on. Gentlemen, I do want to thank you for today. I hope this was a, a refresher at best, or maybe the first look at what high efficiency with hydronics really is. Capturing the condensate, you know, living the dream, being that energy and comfort installing contractor, making money, elevating your prices to separate from the masses, the guys who don't even install outdoor uh, reset sensors, you know. Um, playing nice with fixing problems, telling somebody, great, you have all good parts and pieces, rip it out and do it again. Why? Well, you went with the low hanging fruit. You went the guy who had the best or lower price. You know, you don't always get what the price is giving you. So please play nice with technology. Learn what the boiler's requirements are with combustion analyzers, dialing in the CO2, dew point, you know, that is key for setting up the high efficiency with the condensation, reclaiming the BTUs that normally leave the building. All right. Jim, any good questions that maybe you want to share? Well, or the, a reoccurring theme, theme that kept coming up was um, about making sure that the homeowner is educated, that they don't understand modulation of boilers because they're used to being blasted with heat. And yeah. the constant response is being, we have to educate them, and you did uh, address that. A couple <laughs> of questions that also came up about water quality. Is this something just in a specific area we have to worry about? My response is no, it's, it's everywhere. everywhere. Yeah, it's everywhere. It's everywhere, yeah. And um, I, that, those are the reoccurring things that came up. Okay. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, it is the end of the presentation. We do have some opportunities to talk after certainly wales darby is um out and about we are up front and exposed so whether it be our individual um emails uh, phones phone numbers cell phones we are working we are open for business and uh we hope you guys are doing well be safe out there you know um it's a funky time so we will prevail you know, once again, I hope to shake hands, and that, that's a tradition, man. I hope I never lose with my friends, and uh, I hope you guys the best. See you soon. Thank you.